Huge round of applause for your host of this presentation, Guy Waits! Thank you, Mark. Commodore, good evening, everyone. Um, as it's uh, as we've got such a packed house, I'm going to shout, okay? I'm not going to use a microphone. So, can you hear me back there? Yeah. Yeah, great stuff. Fantastic. Uh, so, tonight's talk really is about my, hopefully, my involvement in the Golden Globe race. And, uh, come here. Nicholas Taylor, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, good evening. Um, good evening public. The Golden Globe race started, most likely, in 1966 and 67, when Francis Chichester sailed single-handed non-stop, uh, single-handed around the world with one stop in Australia, okay, where he had his boat refitted, you know, all his sails worked on, reprovisioned, had a bit of a break, you know, a bit of a holiday, and set off again. Returned to a massive welcome in Plymouth, hundreds of thousands of people, knighthood by the Queen, etc., etc. Okay, so then, of course, it's only a matter of time before people start saying, well, if someone can go around the world with one stop, can it be done with no stops at all? And that basically gave birth to the Sunday Times Golden Globe race in 1968. Okay. So they didn't actually come up with the race and people enter, as would normally be the case. Sailors from predominantly around Europe started making the news about their potential <coughs> attempt to sail single-handed non-stop and the Sunday Times basically hijacked the idea and built a race around the people who were going to be doing this okay and effectively entered them in it whether they liked it or not so that was very creative on their part um, of the nine entrants okay only one man finished and that was Robin Knox Johnson obviously we know him as Sir Robin Knox Johnson now uh, founder of the Clipper Race and I was skipper of Dare to Lead uh, in the 1920 race until uh, the early uh, part of 1920 when of course the pandemic put, a, put pay to that race uh, they're hoping to restart in, two, in, uh, in February of next year so that'll be two years that that race has been postponed waiting to restart okay? I sadly won't be taking up my skipper role of dare to lead to continue that race because it finishes in August of next year and I'm supposed to be starting the GGR in September the 4th next year so there just isn't time with all the work I've got to do to my boat uh, Sagamata in Whitby uh, to get to the start line okay so 1968 was the start of the original Sunday Times Golden Gold race nine entrants only one person finished okay in 2018 Don McIntyre Australian started uh, the 50th anniversary so only the second time that the Golden Globe race has run, nothing to do with the Sunday Times anymore. And uh, out of 18 starters of the race, okay, only five finished. Now since 1968 and Sir Robin's circumnavigation of the globe, okay, less than 200 people have circumnavigated single-handed non-stop. Okay, there's more people have been into space than have done it single-handed non-stop around the world. There's more people climb Everest every year than have sailed single-handed non-stop around the world. It's a massive, massive challenge. And I suspect the 2022 edition might not be a great deal different to the outcome of the 2018 when only five people finished. Currently, out of 32 entries, okay, there are still 25 who are lining up for the start line. The other seven have, for one reason or another, fallen by the wayside already. Okay. Um, how many of those 25 we see on the start line in September next year is only a matter of time. Okay. Obviously, I'm intending to be there. We'll go into that a bit later. And how many will we see cross the finish line? Well, that all just a, a, so just a matter of time, isn't it, to see it's still a massive, massive challenge. Um, the Golden Globe race is a retro race. It's based, it, to some extent, on the original rules of the race or the technology and the equipment that was available to the sailors at that time. Okay. 
Okay. So although we've got satellite technology now, we've got GPS, we've got chart plotters, we've got sat phones, and we can get weather anywhere in the world, weather reports, etc. Okay, you're denied an awful lot of that technology. It's a retro race. It's back to navigating with a sextant and compass and a timepiece. You have a HF long-range radio to get the time signals from when you're in the middle of the ocean so that your timekeeping is accurate for your accurate celestial navigation fixes. Um, the satellite phones we have on board for safety reasons are only there to contact the race organisation Don McIntyre or one of his member of his team. Okay, It's not for calling my wife Julie or calling the club and giving you an update in the middle of the ocean. Okay, If you do any of that, you're disqualified from the race. Okay. So we've got the technology on the boats. We've got the EPIRGs and the life rafts and the survival suits and the first aid kits and all the modern technology that you would want to have. But a lot of it we're not actually allowed to use if you want to stay in the race as such. Okay. Um, Jean-Luc Van Den Ed was the winner of the 2018 edition of the race. He very nearly didn't make it himself. He was pitch pulled in the Southern Ocean on his way to Cape Horn and damaged his mast. Actually phoned Don McIntyre on the sat phone uh, to announce his retirement from the race. And then within 24, hour, 24 hours had a bit of a rethink and decided that actually if he was going to continue <coughs> sailing somewhere with his damaged boat, or damaged mast, he may as well continue for the finish line and see if he could get there. And he proved worthwhile. He turned out to be the winner. Uh, although he did have uh, the Dutchman um, snapping his heels all the way up the Atlantic, who he only beat by a day. So 211 days it took him. That's 100 days less than Sir Robin Knox Johnson. So technology's moved on. <laughs> Our knowledge... <laughs> Uh, you know, comparing Suheili to the kind of boats that we can enter in the Golden Globe race, uh, there's, there's quite a bit of, uh, you know, we've, we've moved on technologically. Uh, sails have moved on in terms of their sail shape and design and cut, etc. But essentially, it's production boats. They've got to be a minimum of 20 in a production mould. Okay, they have to have been designed before 1988. They've got to be long keel, fiberglass. You're not allowed to increase mast height or boom length. Uh, you can't fit bow sprits unless they're part of the original design. So it's, it's, it's very clever and very simple. It keeps the race rules and the boats that you can sail fairly restricted so that just about anyone can enter the race. Okay. Um, from 2018 race, we've seen some rule changes. Okay. There was a little bit of scandal in the 2018 race about people getting weather reports, private weather routing, over the HF radio, uh, so amateur radio use has been banned for the 2022 edition. Okay, we have been allowed, as a, a sort of maybe a bit of a give back to the entrance, to use weather facts, which isn't exactly 1960s technology, but it's not a million miles away. Very few people use weather facts anymore. We've moved on basically in, in technology and satellite weather information, um, but the HF weather facts runs through the HF radio. You need the HF radio to get the weather facts signals. Uh, and there are still, it's part of uh, GMDSS, uh, the global safety system, that uh, you can, in theory, get a weather facts uh, reception anywhere in the globe. Okay. Whether the true, whether the, uh, you know, the reality is anything like uh, what the promises are supposed to be remains to be seen. I certainly struggled in parts of the Atlantic to get decent weather facts uh, aboard Sagamata on the way back from Panama last year. So um, it'll be interesting to see just how good it is or isn't when you're in the middle of the Southern Ocean. So we'll see about that as well. So that's a little bit about the history of the race or the build up to the GDR. The 2000, uh, sorry, the 1968-69 race that was won by Sir Robin as the only finisher and the 2018 race and a little bit about what's coming in the 2022 race with regard to the number of entrants. The route has changed a little bit as well. Uh, we've got an extra two uh, what are called media drop points. These are, these are uh, <coughs> positions around the globe where we have to meet with, with Don McIntyre, race organizer. In a, he comes out in a rib. They're fairly close to shore. And uh, he comes out, does a boat-to-boat -boat interview. It's all on Facebook Live so that people can watch it. It's, the race is covered on the website 
uh, from the point of view of tracking. So you will know for the greater part of the race where I am with far more accuracy than I will, okay? Um, because you have the technology, I don't have the access to it, okay? There's a race tracker on the boat, I have no access to the information that that's sending back. Okay. So an extra couple of drop points where we hand over any film that we've shot because it's all, it's all about, uh, about the retro image of the race, shooting uh, pictures by uh, old-fashioned film cameras, old-fashioned cine cameras. They do you allow you to use GoPro type technology as well, so long as you've got no access to the digital GPS information that's inside it. Okay? And you hand that over to Don so that he can keep the media and the publicity going as you're going around the world. There's also once weekly satellite phone call conversations with Don only, but a, a sort of uh, over the satellite uh, interview which is broadcast via the website on SoundCloud and then every day you have to send two text messages by satellite yellow brick tracking uh, text messaging device just so that they know there's some human activity going on about it's not just a tracker polling your position every hour of, of, of the day and you've fallen over the side and the boat's just sailing itself along. Okay. Um, so there's lots of technology for you to follow the race and for potential sponsors etc to follow the race. But there's very little for me in terms of technology. It's old school sextant, HF radio, compass and, and, uh, and a lot of dead reckoning to find your position. Um, so where are we right now with my entry in the Golden Globe race. Well, first of all, I'm a fully paid up entrant in the race, okay? Uh, eight and a half thousand pounds entry fee, that's now paid. Uh, the boat was bought and paid for about uh, a year and a half ago, uh, right at the, from the end of the Clipper race being postponed in the Philippines, we bought the boat. And, uh, and then as soon as lockdown allowed, okay, I left the UK to Panama <clears throat> to actually collect the boat. So I bought a boat from someone I'd never met, uh, a boat that I'd never seen, uh, but it was an entry in the 2018 race, and I was aware of the previous owner of the, of the race. He retired early. It clearly just wasn't for him. Um, and so I arrived in Panama in October of last year, uh, spent six to seven weeks in Panama getting Sagamata ready for that trip back across the Atlantic. Okay, or as ready as I could make her. Uh, we then had to wait for the um, tropical depressions that come across in the trade winds and blow through the uh, Caribbean Sea, uh, that season, the hurricane season to blow through, and following the, the for a sort of dying last cells of, of hurricane activity coming through the uh, Caribbean Sea uh, towards the late November period of the year, saw my opportunity, left Panama in Sagamata single-handed and uh, basically sailed as far east as I possibly could in the sort of unseasonable weather or wind direction that I had at the time uh, until the weather filled in from the west, which it normally does. It, it blows from, uh, from east to west pretty much all the time through the Caribbean and you've also got, because of that constant airstream, You've also got an equatorial current which is taking you from east to west, none of which is great when you want to go northeast. Okay, so getting as far east as possible before I had to go north because that was what all the wind would allow was the plan. Um, managed to get out of the Caribbean Sea on the wind the whole time, uh, out past Jamaica on the port side, uh, Haiti on the starboard side, Cuba on the port side, out through into the Atlantic proper. And that's, that's already a couple of thousand miles under your belt, okay? Everyone who enters the Golden Globe race, one of the rule changes from 2018 to 2022, because of, I think basically fueled by the fact that so many people retired for one reason or another in the 2018 race, was to make it a qualifying um, rule of the race for 2022 that you have to sail a minimum 2,000 nautical mile passage solo in the boat you're entering with wind vane steering and using celestial navigation. You can have GPS for that as well as a backup, but you have to actually do some sun sights and star sights with your sextant as part of that, just to demonstrate to the race organizers that you actually 
<coughs> and do that before you just push off and think you're going to sail around the world on your own. So left the Caribbean, headed out into the Atlantic, and very early on in that passage realized that there was a problem with Sagamata's mast, okay? And basically an S-bend. So the, when the boat was on the wind, the mast was d deflecting to leeward in the lower part of the mast, and then above the spreaders, it was going to windward. So it's a big S-bend curve, okay? So I immediately tacked the boat, put her on the other tack, and exactly the same problem on the opposite side. So at that point, I was nursing the boat all the way. I just thought, all I have to do is get the boat home, and then I can sort it out. But there was absolutely no point in going back to Panama. The facilities there just wouldn't have not proved worthwhile. Uh, there was nowhere really to stop that could solve the problem between there and home. Uh, it was really a case of just nurse the boat and keep going. So headed across the Atlantic, stayed low in the in latitude, okay, my original plan, I've had everything been fine, was to go north uh, and get to about 35 to 40 degrees north to pick up the uh, southern side of the depressions that come across the Atlantic so I could sail downwind, get home quickly, okay, uh, that was ruled out because I didn't want to encounter any bad weather or, or as little of it as I possibly could, so I stayed low in latitude down in the sort of 25, 30, 35, creeping north very, very slowly, but predominantly going east. So I was upwind all the way, heavily reefed, sailing slowly, just basically protecting Sagamata's mast as much as I could. Um, and got to within 80 nautical miles of the Azores. So by this point, I've been at sea for, I think it was 42, 43 days, um, 80 miles from arriving in the Azores, and ran into an easterly storm. Okay, so turned the boat around, sailed back out into the Atlantic. The last thing you want to do is to sail towards the Azores, where the seabed is coming up to meet you. The nearer and nearer you get to land, okay, you want to be out in deeper, safer water, <clears throat> where the sea state isn't as violent as it can be close in shore. So turned the boat around, sailed back out into the Atlantic, took the sails down, streamed warps from the stern and day two got hit by a big wave, put the mast down in the water, the wind turbine disappeared, three of the blades sheared off of the five, the wind turbine was now just shaking itself to pieces so I had to lasso it with a piece of rope and basically snap it off its mast before I lost the whole lot and when I was finished sorting that out I turned around, looked forward and I could see the rigging wires, the catch rounds and the lowers on the port side were all a little bit slack, <laughs> which is, you know, obviously, you know, all sailors, you know, that's not good. Um, and then I went up to the mast and had a look, and there was a big <coughs> crease, a horizontal <coughs> crease. Um, I virtually put my hand in on the port side of the mast. So the mast was still standing, but it was significantly weakened. So at this point, I just kept running with it and just basically, you know, hoped that uh, I didn't get hit by another equally large wave because I think another one would have brought the mast down and, uh, and basically rode that bad weather out until it blew through which took another three or four days because it, before I could even think about turning the boat around and actually sailing in the right direction. When that happened, so four days after the knockdown, I'm now not 80 nautical miles from the Azores Islands, I was over 300 miles from the Azores Islands because I've spent all that time sailing away. Okay, just to run away from the storm um, and it took a further two weeks to actually arrive in a safe harbour in the Azores okay, just protecting the mast a boat that had a tacking angle that was virtually 180 degrees okay, because I just couldn't put, a, put in up enough sail mm -hmm. to get the boat sailing to windward I was literally reaching across the breeze from one tack to the other it was just infuriating apart from anything uh, but I just had to stay with it, uh, slowly running out of water, slowly running out of food. <laughs> um, I managed to uh, hear uh, a Coast Guard helicopter over the, over the VHF radio when I was near one of the Azores Islands, um, San Miguel. And uh, it was a helicopter on exercise doing a, high, uh, a practice highline lift of a, of a container ship. And when they'd finished talking to one another, I jumped on the VHF radio and got his attention and, and explained that you know, I was struggling to get to a safe harbour and could he offer any advice and uh, 
he came back to me with some weather with a weather report for the next few days which helped and I made some further routing towards Sao Miguel, the, the western side, uh, sorry, the eastern side of the island, uh, in a gale, another gale of wind was building. And, uh, and then I got a call on the VHF from the Coast Guard from that island asking me if I was okay. I explained the situation to them. They apparently had been tracking me on AIS the whole time, ever since I called the, the helicopter up two days earlier. And they found a little fishing village for me called Puvasau. Okay, which is on the south side, uh, towards the eastern end of uh, São Miguel Island. He said, uh, if you can't make it to, um, to the capital of the island, where you're supposed to go for immigration clearance purposes, go to Puvasau. They will come to meet you. Okay? So I pulled into Puvasau, uh, <clears throat> literally had enough fuel left in the tank to furl away my sails, okay, and switch the engine on as I sailed through the harbour entrance. I got six metres from the pontoon and the engine died and literally drifted <laughs> onto the dock and threw the lines over the side and got tied off. Uh, so that was quite an adventure. Um, the maritime police came to see me, the, the National Guard came to see me. This, this apparently is standard fare in, in the Azores. This is not because I'm a fugitive of any kind. Okay? And then the lady from the health department came and I had the same questions from all of them. Uh, the maritime police guy started, he had his clipboard, he had his mask on, okay, and he's standing, you know, keeping two metres away from me. I was told in no uncertain terms not to get off the boat uh, until all these formalities had been finished. He was asking me, he said, where are you from? I said, oh, I'm from the UK. What was your last port of call? Panama. He said, Panama, okay, Panama. He said, uh, how many on board? I said, just me. And he's, his eyes are getting wider and wider. He said, uh, how, how long have you been at sea? Uh, he, he said, no, he said, when did you leave? I said, oh, it was, uh, was it November the 21st? Mm. I can't remember now. It was late November. I gave him this date. And he went, I could see him going, you know, weeks, months, <laughs> days like this, trying to add up. And I said, 59 days. And his eyes just went, 50, 59 days. Okay, so he went away. Maritime, uh, the National Guard guy came. Same conversation, same questions, different sheet of paper, I guess. Uh, same facial reaction from behind this mask. And then the, uh, the lady from the health department came down with a, with a temperature gun, and she said, same questions. And when I said 59 days, she just pulled the mask down, shot me in the head with the temperature gun, and said, he's fine. No, you know, he's been on his own for 59 days, and he's still alive. He can't be, you know, can't be dying of COVID. So... Um, so that put me in the Azores Islands. Uh, I then spent the best part of three weeks phoning round and emailing and messaging just about every contact I could, every mast company, every boatyard, every rigger, every friend I knew in sailing to see if they could find me a piece of the same mast section that we have on Sagamata. It's an old Proctor Spa and that was just, it just didn't happen. There were some, some potential leads here and there but it, it all came to nothing. The plan was to take the mast off in the Azores, sleeve it uh, with a section, uh, rivet it all back together just, just to basically get me home. Uh, that didn't work out. So then I ordered carbon fibre and epoxy and all the materials I needed to, uh, to affect a, a carbon fibre repair in the Azores. Took the mast off on this little fishing jib crane like we've got here outside, the yellow one outside the harbour. Um, outside the Yacht Club rather, and um, laid the mast down on the quay side. This is in March um, <clears throat> of, this year, of this year, and uh, pulled a little bit of the crease out, managed to straighten the mast a little bit, because even, even off the boat with all the rigging slack, the boat had a big banana bend in it. Uh, sorry, the, um, the mast had this huge banana bend. So I managed to pull some of the crease out and straighten about 50% of that bend out, okay, and then basically wrapped a meter of the mast in carbon fiber, uh, with the fibers in the center where the damage was to about six or seven millimeters thick, okay. It's a solid laminate carbon fiber. Um, and then wrapped it, this is in the key side, okay, uh, wrapped it all up in a black plastic bag. So what little sun there was at that time of year would actually keep the bag warm and cure the epoxy. I left it like that for two days, 
went back, peeled it all off, cut the carbon fiber on the mast track where the mainsail goes up, chiseled it out with a hammer and chisel. I mean, you're using carbon fiber and then you're using a handsaw and a hammer and chisel, you know. <laughs> but then chased out the back of the carbon fiber so we had this gap where I could actually run the mainsail up and down. Um, drilled some holes up the, up the aft end of the carbon fiber, riveted it all together. Uh, got some help from the local fishermen and the local community, got the mast back on the boat, um, re ran all the rigging and then waited for a weather window to, to come back and managed to get to Falmouth in 15 days um, with the mast still standing, so that was great. Yeah. Um, and then it was just a case of you know, hopping from Falmouth to Plymouth, Plymouth to Gosport, Gosport to Ramsgate, Ramsgate to uh, Lowestoft, Lowestoft to Scarborough, and then on the final leg of the journey, Scarborough up to Whitby. And Sagamata is now in Coates uh, Marine Boatyard with the mast off now, and uh, hopefully putting a cover on us soon so that, because the weather's turned, uh, I can start doing all the uh, deck refit that I need to do, ready for the start in September of next year. So it's already been a massive challenge, <laughs> but I can safely say that even not counting any of the sailing that I've done before, okay, just with Sagamata, um, I've sailed more miles in Sagamata than most of the entries in the next Golden Globe race, and consequently I feel I know more about Sagamata and the preparation I need to make to her for the Golden Globe race than just about anybody else. A lot of the entrants in the race have refitted their boat and then done their qualifying. So they've made all the modifications and changes and now they're starting to sail it. I know what I need to do to Santa Marta and I won't be going into too much detail because we're on Facebook Live. <laughs> <laughs> I've had this conversation with Clive. We might, we might, a little bit later, we might turn the camera off and go into a bit more detail for you. Okay? So, so long as you prom pr uh, promise to keep it to yourself. Um, but I've got lots of ideas. I basically wrote my refit plan on the way across the Atlantic whilst I was sailing the boat. You know, literally with a tape measure in my hands at time, measuring how far I want to move the winches, measuring where that's going to go and where I'm going to get rid of that, and that's no good, that's going, I need one of those instead. <coughs> and, and understanding all the problems uh, and all the potential pitfalls that I might have with Sagamata if I leave her in the configuration she's in, and how much better she'll be if I make all the changes that I want to make. Okay. Um, so it's already been a massive challenge, but we're still on track. Okay. We are trying to raise some money to get to the start line, and that's not to pay for me to have everything on some great wish list. Okay, It's literally the minimum to get to the start line. Obviously, need a new mast. Uh, there's nothing that is going to be done to that mast uh, now other than throwing in the skip. Um, we need new sails. There's the safety kit to buy, the satellite communications kit, the first aid kit. The medical kit alone is nearly £2,000. Um, the life raft to service, the EPIRBs, etc., etc. It just goes on. The list of equipment goes on and on and on. Okay, and that target for us is £50,000. Uh, we've raised £17,000 so far, all through donations to the GoFundMe. Uh, if you go to guywaitsailing.com, you'll find on the um, supporters page, you'll find a link to GoFundMe. Uh, if anyone wants to or knows anyone who can make a contribution, large or small, it will be greatly received, I can promise you. Um, as I say, up to now, I've managed to fund everything myself, from buying the boat, bringing it back to the UK, all the, all the work I've done so far, all the storage fees and the insurance and everything else, and the entry fee is all paid for um, you know, by myself. Um, that's helping keeping the price down of getting to the start line. But there are certain things that I just have to have. Okay, and that's what brings us to £50,000. We've raised 17 so far. Uh, so that's another 33 to find. Okay. Um, we've been doing a lot of business meetings with local businesses in the Scarborough area particularly. Okay, we are making some headway, but as yet there's no actual money on the table. Okay. And it's 270 days to race start. Okay, so uh, a lot to do, a lot to find just to get there. 
as far as the refit work is concerned, all the old antifoul has now been scraped away from the bottom of Sagamata. Okay, I did that all by hand uh, in Whitby uh, in the summer months, where as soon as the boat came out of the water, I started that process. In between working away, predominantly for Tall Ships Youth Trust, uh, to keep the funds coming in, to keep the dream alive, as it were. Yeah. So there must be somewhere between six and nine layers of anti-foul paint that came off the bottom of Sagamata. Okay, I think I've reduced the wetted surface area by about a square metre, because the boat's that much thinner than it was. Um, the, the boat was bought with a fixed three-blade propeller, okay, so you're dragging a fixed three-blade propeller through the water. Okay, that's gone, and uh, we now have a replacement. Okay, that's something else I funded myself uh, at a cost of just over £2,000 for the new prop. Um, but that's going to help a lot and then there's all the internal work that I'm doing at the moment now that the weather's changed so we stripped out the forepeak completely the rules allow that if you put a watertight bulkhead in forward either a door or completely seal up the forepeak okay so the only way in and out is basically the deck hatch um, you can strip all the furniture all the cabinet work and the shelves and etc out of there to make the front of the boat lighter and that's something I've been doing. That's that's nearly complete now. And I've now moved on to a lot of really unpleasant fiberglass grinding and sanding work for the new mast. Okay. I'll go into more detail about that a bit later uh, when the camera's being turned off. <laughs> um, so that's, that's where I am in terms of refit. I've got an awful lot of work to do. Uh, I had a little bit of a setback this week because we we had a, some very kind volunteers uh, from certainly some of the people in the room here tonight and one or two others to come and help me put a cover over the boat and then the tarpaulin hasn't arrived when they said it would and so that's knocked that back. Uh, basically we need to cover the boat to get out of the weather so we can strip all the deck uh, and, uh, and start making all the, all the deck preparation work. There's a lot of old equipment that needs to go, uh, there's a lot of equipment that needs to move there's a lot of holes to fill <laughs> and some new ones to drill and cut in various places and the deck paint really needs replacing. It's, it's uh, on, the, on, on the wrong day and the wrong kind of weather it's, uh, it's like a skating rink in places and that's no good for the security of anyone let alone a solo sailor. Um, but uh, so that's where we are right now. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? If it's anything too sensitive, <coughs> I'll answer it later. <laughs> yes? Are there any other boats of exactly the same class as Sagamata in the race? There are three the trade wing 35s entered oh. in the race. Yeah. Yeah. And one of them, uh, one of the other ones also entered <coughs> the 2018 edition. Okay. He finished. That was Istvan Kopar in a boat called Puffin. He was the not the last to finish, the fourth to finish. He took something like 265 days to get round. Tapio Lettinen, Finnish guy, who's also entered in the Ocean Globe race, which is the recreation of the Whitbread, which starts the following year, so he's going to be a busy man. Okay. He had a terrible problem with goose barnacles growing on the bottom of his boat. The story is that he, whilst he was away, he ordered or instructed the boatyard to apply a certain anti-foul to his boat and they applied the wrong sort. And as he sailed around the world, he got lots of barnacles growing on the bottom of his boat. Have you ever seen goose barnacles? These long tubes that grow. It's possibly the worst drag device or the best drag device you could possibly have growing on the bottom of your boat. And he was, his boat, uh, Asteria, was absolutely covered in them by the time he got to the finish. He was crawling up the, up the Atlantic on the way to the finish line at a knot to a knot and a half average for days and weeks. And 330 something days, I think it took him to get around, nearly 11 months. Yes, Chris. There were many people who sank an awful lot of reflective pints and glasses of wine thinking, having heard about the damage to the mast and then the whole boat being toppled over mm. and there was just you 
Yeah. And we spent several Sundays in this club thinking about that in the warmth and the quiet and all the rest of it. And we think, God, how do you manage that? Um, and there's you by yourself yeah. in this situation. So how do you, what sort of feelings go through your mind when it's just you, an awfully large ocean, a boat that's in a bit of a mess? I mean, how are you feeling and how mess, did you yeah. muscle the marshal in your mind to focus on getting through? Well, if, I mean, the first thing is probably a dreadful swear word um, <clears throat> because, um, you know, your boat is everything. Okay, I was fortunate that I was awake when it happened. I was standing up in the, just the, literally the threshold between the navigation galley area that you step down into when you, you know, when you come down the companionway steps, you've got the nav to starboard and the galley to port. And then there's a sort of like a little natural threshold with some half bulkheads between that and the main cabin saloon area where the bunks are. And I was stood with my back to literally resting on one of them, holding on. To the handle that's built into the one in front of me on the starboard side when the wave hit that way and I went backwards and I was remember basically I was looking at what should have been in front of me and was still in front of me but it was now up there okay and then out of the corner of my eye from behind the lee cloth where all my bags were bags of clothing and sailing kit and sleeping bag and stuff literally just went up to the ceiling rolled across the ceiling and then drop down on the other side of the boat and then you know and there's all the stuff off the nav table you know the, the chart table lid came open and that all went west as well and just about anything else that wasn't tied down was clattering or clattering around inside the boat um, but your your main concern when that happens not the first time i've been in a knockdown um, is what's happened to the mast you know that's your first thing um, now, you know when a mast comes down, because there's you know, an awful lot of clatter bang going on on deck, and that didn't happen. There is also uh, like a little port light, a little skylight in the cabin top uh, forward in Sagamata, and I went forward to that and had a quick look up, and the mast was still standing. At that point, I thought everything was fine from that point of view. Then I could hear the noise of the wind turbine shaking itself to bits. Uh, so I went out and dealt with partially dealt with the wind turbine and that's when I turned and saw the state of the mast and the crease in it. Um, I did try and do a little bit of um, remedial repair work uh, to, to try and support the mast but I had really had no idea whether or not it was actually going to do any benefit whatsoever. Uh, it was, from then on it was just about nursing the boat or nursing the mast as much as I could. Till I got it to a place where I could physically do something about it. You know, it's tricky to do something with 42 foot of aluminium tubing sticking up in the air when you're in the middle of a storm and you're getting battered. Um, you need to do it somewhere when the world stops rocking around, don't you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, you, yeah, I don't, I personally don't get stressed particularly by those situations. Um, but your first concern, of course, is, is what states the boat in. That's number one. And so long as the boat's all right, then, you know, you can worry about yourself another day. Yes, Clive? Yeah, uh, I see you've got solar panel there and you're talking about your wind uh, yes. generator. What are you going to be allowed on the, on the race? Right, so you must have 300 amp hours of battery on the boat. Okay, and it's got to be either AGM, absorbed glass map, or gel, which if very briefly, if you don't know anything about battery technology, uh. it's batteries that are designed in such a way that you can invert them and they continue working. If you did that with an ordinary car battery, a lead acid, it would just fry itself to bits and, and be useless in no time. But with a gel or an AGM, they can get rolled, uh, and that's obviously why they're in the part of the rules. So you've got to have 300 amp hours minimum. Um, you can have solar, hydro generator, and, and or wind turbine. Okay. I, I only need to replace the wind turbine blades and I can reuse the wind turbine. Um, solar panels I think are worth taking if you've got the deck space for them. Some of those will be going and some of them will be moved into different places. 
for, for me, I think. And then hydro generator would be nice, but that's more of a wish list item than an absolute essential. Yeah. Well, that water guy, you, you ran out <laughs> when you were doing one of your trips. I know, before. so yeah, on, uh, a, on a previous transatlantic, yeah. um, I've, well, twice actually, so I obviously haven't learned my lesson. Twice I've run out of water, okay? Oh, I've <laughs> certainly got very low. Um, and had to rely on collect, collecting rainwater off the mainsail predominantly. Uh, so the Golden Globe race rules say that you must carry all your water. You, water makers are not allowed because we didn't have desalinators in the 1960s. Um, they're a more recent technology uh, and they also use an awful lot of power. If you want to run a water maker you really have to start thinking about generators and uh, or certainly very good hydro generators to, just to give the power to run the thing. Anyway, they're not allowed in the GGR. You've got to carry your water and or catch rainwater. I suspect I'll be doing both. And I think most people will. Um, some of the guys in the 2018 edition were running low on water. One retired, uh, Mark Sinclair, retired into Adelaide, his home port, Australia. Because he was one of his concerns was uh, water shortage, and the other was also I think he was also affected by goose barnacles as well. So not the only one who's changed the kind of antifoul that he's using. He's actually an entrant in this next race as well. So he's learnt a lot, no doubt about it. Yeah. Is he in the same boat? He is. Yeah. Karen, yes. Yeah. Yeah, Captain Coconut is known as. He's <laughs> got a bright orange boat, and he's painted even more of it bright orange as well. He's a really nice guy. But, uh, he's, uh, he's actually currently sailing from Adelaide um, to Le Sable de Long in France, which is where the race starts and finishes. Um, as his, obviously he needs to get to the start line. It's the right time of year to do it. Okay, to be in the Southern Ocean at this time of the year is, you know, it's there. It's the Southern Hemisphere summer, so it's the right time to go. And he also gets to, to finish his, uh, his 2018 edition. You are, if you make one stop, you're kind of relegated, if you like, into the, what's called the Chichester class. Okay, because Chichester <laughs> obviously stopped once. Didn't they? So, uh, so he's, he's the only person, I think, who's still eligible to, to finish the 2018 race. Uh, as a you know, as an entrant. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, go on. Sorry, no, no, no. I was just going to ask you two mm. questions. Yeah. First, when did you start saving? How old were you? And the other question is, what's your personal reason for wanting to do this? Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, I started sailing when I was 25. A friend of mine, David Swift from the Midlands, uh, Leicestershire, he phoned me up one day. He said, uh, "Do you want to come sailing?" One weekend, I've chartered a boat in the summer. It was a late season charter, November. <laughs> it was absolutely freezing, uh, but I loved every minute of it. It was fantastic. Really enjoyed it. And it just so happened that I'd recently moved <coughs> to Kent, to East Kent, and friends I'd made there uh, heard that I'd been away sailing for the weekend and said, "Oh, we just bought a boat." And we want to go racing from Ramsgate. Would you like to crew for us? And I was there every week. Just, you know, hardly a day I wasn't on the boat when they were racing. Racing around the Goodwin Sands, racing across the English Channel to France or, you know, Belgium or wherever, North Sea races, to Skaveningen, etc., etc. Sailing the boat round to Cowes and doing Cowes Week or doing the Round the Island race. I think we did nine Round the Island races. You know, every year we were there and finished first in class twice as well it was fantastic so i just just hooked and it was predominantly racing it was all racing 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 loved it um so that was starting at 25 uh so um almost 30 years now i'm sailing um ever since i think ever since i was a child i i was prone to wandering off on my own and just you know without a care in the world um and as soon as I got into sailing, I was immediately fascinated by 
the stories of the soul around the world races and the expedition, you know, the, the people who did it all by themselves. It just, it just intrigued me and fascinated me um, and inspired me, obviously. Um, so when I first sailed the Atlantic single-handed in Red Admiral, a contest 26, uh, Red Admiral was in here a few years ago. Uh, Andy Stenhouse in Scotland owns her now. And um, that was in, attempted in 2010 got a thousand miles out into the Atlantic, broke the main bulkhead underneath the mast, so a problem with masts as well as a problem with water. Um, had to turn around, sail home, rebuilt the, the bulkhead with carbon fibre and all sorts of stuff, and which you're not allowed to use in a retro race because it's modern technology. It's all, it's all very retro, is a uh, Golden Globe race. It's all Dacron white sails. You're not allowed carbon fibre. You're not allowed Dyneema rigging, uh, running rigging. It's all going to be basic polyester stuff um, and then rebuilt the boat didn't want to wait another four years for the next Jester challenge as it was then uh, and sailed the boat single-handed across the Atlantic and back in 2011 and that was the first time I ran out of water and then managed to almost do it again in Betsy in 2016 the Corrigan so, uh, but, uh, but managed both times yes Clive Go on then, Guy. How sharp is your celestial navigation? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't say it's sharp. <laughs> Rusty as hell. Yeah. It's um, there's a I, you might have seen it because I haven't been watching, but there's a there's a video in there somewhere of me with a sextant in my hand, and you can see the horizon in the background going like this up and down, and I'm wobbling around all over the place, and you're trying to get the sun, you know, and the worst place in the world is anywhere near the equator. <laughs> Okay, where the sun is right above you. Trying to, when you're north or south of the equator, where we are, okay, the sun never really gets that high in the sky. So it's relatively easy to bring the sun down to the horizon because it's not got that far to go. You try it somewhere near the equator where it's right above you and you bring it down and even on a relatively calm day, the image of the sun is swinging from side to side. like It's absolute hell. I hate it. <laughs> but it's you know it uh, but I, I it is it's basic maths but it's actually I'm so actually you, very you be de dead reckoning and when you be pulling a taffrel log you're gonna be yes so you're not allowed to use electronic logs so you know an electronic speed device okay you, what you have to have whether you use it or not is a trailing log so one of the old walker trailing logs yeah. okay um, which it, I mean it's a it's a great piece of equipment to look at. Um, it's like a baker light <laughs> type thing. It looks like an old-fashioned wing mirror, sort of cone-shaped thing, with little dials on it, a bit like an old electricity meter with all little wheels going around. They are beautiful. And then you get a nice long, you got a long piece of cord with a, a three-bladed spinner on the end, which is very attractive to any kind of predatory fish. Okay, um, They regularly get bitten off and lost. And that thing just twirls around in the water and the, you know the little wheel goes around on your on your trailing log and tells you how many miles you've sailed and that's how you work out your speed but most of the time it's just just experience you look you look at the water going you know your boat don't you yeah. you look at the water going by and you go yeah it's about four knots and that's about as yeah yes hi i'm nikki i'm his, his other half um <laughs> my better half uh, i work in um in mental health and stuff so i know you spend a lot, long time a period, long time alone on a boat mm. so yeah. how do you keep yourself motivated because obviously you must face a lot of like downers and sort of being alone a lot of the time uh, how do you cope with that and like yeah. knockbacks and things like that how do you stay focused i don't or i don't struggle with being on my own okay that uh, that is just if I did, I wouldn't do what no. I do. I don't think. I, honestly, it's a that that doesn't bother me at all. It's not a. It's a fifty nine days is the longest I've been on my own. Fifty nine days. Which was Sagamata, and prior to that was fifty five days, which was Betsy, the little Corriby, all the way across the Atlantic. Um, I'm fine with that. I actually find it quite easier the less you communicate with the outside world. Um, it, it can get very frustrating um, communicating with shore because you they don't fully understand your situation and you don't always get the information that you want or would like to get. So sometimes to not have it at all is actually a lot easier. How do you keep yourself like, on track? Like, sort of, do you keep a structure and routine during the day? What do you do to keep um, yourself going? 
I find that uh, I sleep for probably no more than an hour and a half at a time. Okay. Really? Oh yeah, and and that's just the nature of being on a boat, living on a boat, trying to sleep on a boat. Mm -hmm. um, the longest I've slept is about four to four and a half hours, mm -hmm. and only because I was absolutely exhausted. Most of the time, you effectively sleep for an hour to an hour and a half, wake up, look around. If you're still a bit tired, you go and try and get some more sleep, and you, you build up your sleep in, if you, look, if you know anything about the circadian <coughs> rhythm, which is all about sleep patterns, and <coughs> that's sort of, you'll, you start to understand why you sleep for an hour to an hour and a half, and then wake up, and then go back off into another <coughs> period of deeper sleep. Um, so, and motivation, really, uh, well, we're all sailors. We all know that wind only does what you want it to do a certain amount of the time. <laughs> and the rest of the time, you just have to live with it, don't you? You know, it's just you just have to deal with it. So I guess it's just a combination. You bounce off sort of thing. It's difficult at times. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. So you, you know that nothing lasts forever, whether it's good or bad. Okay, so you take the good times when they come to you. Yeah. And when the bad times come, you go, well, okay, it's not going to last. It will get better. Make the best of it for now. You know, there's better times to come. Uh, there's also the element of just happily being on my own, so that's not such a problem. And also, because of that, not being phased about being out there on your own. And I think if you, any one of those things bothered you, that you wouldn't want to do it. As simple as that. Yeah. So for me, so when people say, how are you going to cope? If it's going to take you seven, eight, nine months to sail around the world on your own, mm. okay? Well, I just look at it like rungs of a ladder. If I can manage 59, that's only another. Yeah. Do you all these captions coming up behind isolation, solitude? <laughs> <laughs> it's all yeah. Like <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very much so. So, uh, take it. It's dried food that you take with you. Is right, it, so. Is there some small treats that you can take with you? Yes, as well? absolutely. So, um, the. It's a balancing act now because you've only got so much space on the boat and you also only want to carry so much water or so much weight, okay? So dried food, for instance, freeze-dried is attractive because it takes up very little space, it's very light, okay? But you need water to rehydrate it before you can eat it, okay? So there's a bit of a trade-off there. Do I put all my weight or most of my weight in water Okay, and have lots of water, but then need lots of water because I'm relying on freeze-dried food? Or do I have cans of things which are now bulky yeah. and heavy but don't need rehydrating? Okay? Mm -hmm. It will be a combination of the two for me. And partly because of that balance of weight and space and also um, just for security as well. Because if I have a water problem, I might have managed my water perfectly, but have been unlucky, like Sir Robin was. He found, just as he got down towards Cape Town, that his water tank had become contaminated and he lost the lot. He was dependent then on catching rainwater for the rest of the circumnavigation. Okay? But all his food, if you've ever seen the photograph of him sitting there surrounded by cans of bully beef and spam or whatever it was that he lived on for however 311 days okay so that's your benefit there is if you don't put all your eggs in one basket with freeze dry you've got cans that don't need rehydrating and obviously they've got liquid in them that you can you don't have to buy uh, a lot of food now in cans doesn't come in a, a sort of salty water. It can come in spring water, or it's just, it's just water. However they treat it, I don't know. But you can actually drink it. So you don't even have to, no longer do you have to drain a can of vegetables because it's salty water. It's just water. You can actually open the can and drink it. You can cook it in the water that's in the can and consume the lot if you're desperate for water. Can so I ask, yes. I, okay. I read the Sheer Blinds book. Yes. Went wrong the wrong way. way. Yeah. And he varnished all these tins of food. Yes. So that they didn't, mm, they didn't rust. But he also varnished the eggs. The eggs. And he had something like 50, 50 yeah. dozen eggs. Yeah. And he, his wife varnished them all for him. Yeah. So they didn't. Yeah. You know. I'll take some eggs, but I won't be taking 50. <laughs> <laughs> eggs again, I'll be back. Yeah. 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 yeah.
<laughs> so, Guy, um, yeah. going to October next year, September, October next year, um, how many competitors are there in total for this race, <coughs> and, and what's the, the gender mix of it? Right, so, as I said, 32 entered the race as, as provisional entries. There's 25 of us left. Okay. Uh, we've had a couple of recent retirements over the past month. Uh, one for very sad reasons, he actually lost his boat, which is really sad, uh, Michael Date. Um, of the 25 that are left, there's only one woman, and that's Kirsten from South Africa. Yeah. So, and there was only one woman, and that was Susie Goodall in the 2018 race. Yeah. There's no shortage of women sailors. Just a shortage of women racers. Well, no, I don't think it's the I don't think it's the races. I think uh, there's only twenty five. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see more, Chris. I think I think we'll see more in the future. We may even get. I don't think we'll get many, too many more entries now. It's too late in the game. But you never know. I could be wrong. Yeah. But some of the competition's pretty stiff. That's for sure. We've got. Um, I'd say people have uh, one, two, or three qualities, you might call them, okay? They either have experience, okay, or they have money, okay, um, or they have sponsorship, okay? Uh, I'm struggling to find the sponsorship. I'm not struggling to find the experience. I think that's, if I've got one ace up my sleeve, it's the amount of sailing I've done and the amount of single-handed sailing I've done, okay? Uh, which is why I'm quite keen not to give away too much of what I'm doing because that's, that's my plus, okay? No one's sharing their sponsorship money with me, okay? No one's sharing their sponsors with me. I'm not sharing my ideas about Sagamata with them. It's a simple equation really, isn't it? Um, you know, just, just, as, just to give you a contrast on sponsorship and one of the big differences between not just the UK but most countries in the world and France where everyone knows the French single-handed sailing is very popular in France okay the, the French sponsor PRB who are known throughout solo racing particularly Vendée Globe etc um, they actually asked a sailor to sail their boat for them in the GDR that's the sponsor asking the sailor to take part in the GGR because they want to win it. Most other people are sailors looking for a sponsor <laughs> because they want to do the race. It's the complete reverse. And that, I'd think, that epitomizes for me the difference between what's going on in France in solo racing or solo sailing and what's going on in, in the rest of the world. In the rest of the world. Yeah. When do you need your sponsorship in mind? And, uh, right, so yeah, it needs to be springtime at the latest, absolute latest of this year. Yeah, because you've got to order the mast, you've got to order sails, and these things don't just happen. You know, you don't go to a channel and buy a new rig. Uh, it's the same with sails, and there's a lot of other work to do as well. So I'm just keeping a refit going at the moment with as much work on the boat as I can do when I'm at home, I'm not working, uh, and the weather's not getting in the way and one thing or another, um, to get the boat to a stage where I can order the mast, go and get it, have it stepped, rig it, tune it, go and get the sails, and build, you know, the important, <coughs> all important key parts of the campaign, but do them you know, leave them as late as I have to leave them, dependent on whether or not or when the sponsorship or the funding comes forward to make it happen. Right now, we've got enough money in the, in the fund to buy the new mast. But that leaves nothing <laughs> for all the safety kit. Yeah, I've got a great rig, but no sales to buy. Yeah, exactly right. Thank you. Sponsorship logos go down the, down the hold. Down the hold, but again, the sponsorship is... Because they want to keep it very simple, and they want to—they actually want to try and keep big sponsors out of the race. It doesn't actually work, but obviously, in the case of PRB, it's not working. And they want to be the only big sponsors, I'm sure, in the race. Um, but the the only uh, typical 
um, sponsorship logos, etc., that you'll see is on spinnakers. Any any free flying downwind sail, you know, a Code Zero or a, a spinnaker or an asymmetric or anything like this, you can have branded, fully branded with slogans and etc. with companies. The boat itself just can only have uh, black aerial typeface, seven and a half centimeters, just around the just around the gunnel, etc. So you'd actually do well almost somebody buying you. A new spinnaker. Absolutely yeah. right, yeah. <coughs> exactly branded, right. Branded yeah. Up. Yeah. 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 So from the people that are in the room, what's the best way for us to support you? Is it sending people to your website and your page or is it Absolutely well that's yeah, because it's all the information right. is there. Yeah, guyweightsailing.com. Absolutely. Yeah. And there you'll find the page on sponsorship where we've broken down how we'd how we'd like to see the sponsorship working. Okay, and then we've got a supporters page as well, which is where you find the link to the GoFundMe. Um, and on the, follow the GoFundMe link, and you'll see there's updates on the GoFundMe periodically throughout the campaign. You'll also find in the updates the breakdown of the cost of all of the items, um, so you know where this fifty thousand pounds comes from. You know, it's not, as I say, it's not a, it's not some sort of dreamy wish list of all the, you know, nice things I could have. It's, uh, it's, it's very basic and bare bones. And this is going to be the most um, sort of interesting question. So when you win the Golden Globe race... Thank you, yes. <laughs> um, which celebrity would you like to, to be you in the movie? <laughs> I'll have to think about that one. I can't imagine any celebrity wanted to be me. Can I choose that one? Yeah. Well, I was thinking of the ex-James Bond, actually, or something like that. Just about Daniel Craig or something. Yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So what music interested. will you be listening to on, on your way around? Do I don't do a, it's, it's That's an interesting question, you know, because uh, some of the entrants are, have talked about, um, you know, the, the massive amount of, uh, of cassette tapes they're going to take. That's the other thing, because it's a retro race. You're not allowed to take CDs <laughs> or MP3 players. You, you can only have, if, you know... <laughs> no Alexa, yeah, absolutely, yeah. It's got to be uh, cassette tapes or just the normal, you know, terrestrial radio. You must have your pencil to rewind them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Get them on the stove. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I'll just, I'll just rely, I'll just rely on, uh, on listening to local radio. Thirty-three discs. Because it's actually uh, a very good way of also finding out where you are. Yeah. 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 Yeah